Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 354 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yeah, today, recording day is Friday, April 5th, 2024. Welcome to the weekend, everybody. And it's going to be, uh, well, still wet today here at the Beaver Lodge. We were very lucky that we did not get hit all that hard by the storm. Uh, Got a little sprinkling, like sugar dusting of snow or frost and some water and some rain here there, but nothing, no major even downpour. It was just wet and gray and a little cold. So uh, we were spared. We weren't. Ah, ha, 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 ha. It's wet, yucky, snowy out there. Mm. I'm your host, the Eager Beaver Pronouns, he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, eh? And with me, as always, as you can hear, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. And while we're here, let's say some good mornings to the kits. So good morning to you, Kit Elaine and Kit Mohan, Kit PNC Bio, Kit Jim, Kit Toronto Dan. Hello, my friend. Kit, hmm, let's see who else do we have. Did I say Linda M yet? No, I have not. Good morning, dear, and good morning, Kit Vim. Nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. Kit Jillian, hey, good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Kit Tavi G, hello. Kit Michael, hello, my friend. Thank you for joining us today. Kit Jen, thank you. And uh, as you can see, uh, your gift did arrive and I did use it. And uh, no residual guy liner, uh, that uh, makeup remover product that you sent me is absolutely fantastic and amazing. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Who else do we have? Um, Kit, ah, uh, Miss Shadika. Hello, my dear. Lovely to see you. And Kit Kendra. And I believe we have everyone, unless you pop in really quickly for your hello. We have our usual Friday show for you. But before we go any further, let's ask Mr. Grizzly how his mental health is doing while I have myself a little bit of breakfast. Uh, Good morning, Mr. Beaver. Um, Mental health-wise, I've been awake since 3.30 this morning. So Mm. probably not going to be the best day. It is a Friday, though, so I'll rejoice in that. But, uh, yeah, I've been up since 3.30. Don't know why. Woke up, could not get back to sleep. And then, of course, 6.05 a.m., a giant 80-pound dog decided that she needed to snuggle up beside me on the very edge of the bed. (laughs) She just crawls in, and I'm like, "What, what what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? I don't understand much of anything, to be honest with you. Understood. <laughs> um, I um, <clears throat> waking up was a little tough today. Oh yeah, why is that? 
Well, uh, the alarm rang, and normally the alarm rings, and you know, a minute or two later, I'm I'm up out of bed. But um, um, the alarm rang, and then somebody warm and soft and snuggly turned around and put their big paw around my waist, and then I was like, "Oh yeah, this is Snuggles. This feels nice. I think I'll stay here a little while." So, no, no, you got to get up. <laughs> yeah, you do. But I, I stayed at. I stayed in bed nine minutes past the alarm, which is mm. something I never do because when I do that, that's when I usually fall asleep again. <laughs> it was warm and snuggly and nice and comfy and oh, yeah. I like snuggles. Well, what can I, I say? I, I I did not want to get up, but it's like, well, um, if I don't take this dog out, I'm going to have to clean up a mess, and I don't want to do that. So let's. Uh, Mm-hmm. Let's take Ms. Lola out for her morning stroll, where, of course, she saw a squirrel and lost her damn mind. Mm-hmm. Which is what she does when she sees squirrels. Yep. If I didn't get up early, I would have uh, missed time with the best damn fam in all of podcasting, and that yeah, was just not acceptable. No, not acceptable. Because so, it's, it's like my vitamin C. It's an essential part of my day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Helps this beaver to grow up big and strong. Okay. Kits and Cubs. Uh, oh, and for people who are wondering, the show is still going well. Three uh, three shows left, and uh, we will be done our run. Uh, but it's uh, it's a blast. It's a lot of fun. Uh, some uh, people from the curling club were there yesterday, so that was kind of nice. It's actually kind of weird. I've been at this curling club for, I think, about seven or eight years now, and uh, I've been acting all this time, and I think this is the show I'm in that most more people from the curling club. I think more people from the curling club have come to see me in this show than have come to see me in all other shows combined. So, <laughs> so but it, it, it's kind of fun after the show, though, when you're you come out and you see people that you know, and you get a little that little pat on the back from people who know you. It just you know, it means a little something, gives a little warm fuzzy. So, yay. Mm-hmm. Um, but things are going very well. Uh, also, for people who are wondering, uh, we did uh, get the analysis, and yes, we do have asbestos. Uh, fortunately, it's just level one, so it'll be the least costly to uh, remove it and abate it. And uh, we have people coming in and giving us quotes, and yeah, it's going to increase the cost by at least a third. Is there any government program for that, though? Because it is. A- I, I will be calling my MP and my MPP to ask. Yeah, yeah. There's got to be something in there. I, you know, I would assume. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, if this was, if this was 15 or 20 years ago when it was like sort of like all the rage. Yes. I know for sure there probably would have been now. I think it's pretty much uh, well, if you didn't do it in the last 20 years, too bad, so sad. You pay for it yourself. (laughs) If you didn't bother to look (laughs) under the hood. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Fortunately, it's not every wall. There's a couple walls that are not, so that will reduce the cost a little bit. But yeah, it's going to be a bit of a job. So uh, we're we're still looking at options because, uh, of course, in, uh, I'm not sure if that's true in the rest of Canada, but in Ontario, at least, if you know you have asbestos in your house, when you come to sell it, you have to actually declare it. Yes. And then some people may not want to buy it. Now, in this current market, when everybody wants a home, I don't think that's going to be too much of a problem. <laughs> but because, you know, so long as it's sealed in and all that kind of stuff, apparently it's fine. Yeah, if, but, if you leave it undisturbed, it's okay. Yeah. So we're looking at various options, but I think I'm just going to prefer to just have it removed mm. and be safe and sorry. Because I don't know how you like pull all this uh, aluminum siding, well, I assume it's aluminum siding or plastic siding off, and then you know put on some stripping and then, you know, strapping, sorry, and then put on uh, all the all the new one and little pieces of the, these asbestos tiles or whatever it is they are don't flake off Yeah, here and there, right? So, um, yeah, I think we're probably going to have to have it uh, completely removed. So, yeah, the, 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 that's a, a, a bit of a financial ding, uh, sadly. Welcome uh, to home ownership. Yes, yes, the money pit, I was told, uh, about which I was told, yes. But we like a little home, so and we're very comfy and we're very cozy here. So uh, I guess we'll give it a little love. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so those are the two major things with me in the news. Um, I don't know if you want to start with something, uh, Mr. Grizzly. I, mean, I do have a couple things, but since we have some time. Well, uh, I'm just doing some production work in the background here. So if, okay. by all means, if you want to take the lead, I mean, I, no I, 
you know, I did write about the Canada rental housing protection thing, which I think is is massive. Uh, but I'm also wondering why so many people are freaking out and going, "This is communism." This is um, like, yeah. well, there, there's a script now, right? We have again, we have to remember, online is not real life. Yeah, uh, there are a ton of people online who are not real people. That too. There might be real people behind the accounts, but the accounts that themselves they're not real people yeah they don't, they're not actual it's not like me typing from my own account it's somebody typing from an account or it has many of them or some of them are bot generated and you know so most of the activity not i, I don't know what percentage but there's a big chunk of the activity that's, that's online that's just there to get you to waste your time and these are the standard tropes right i mean you got people you know upset that kids are being fed right now yeah, right. I don't. Yeah. That, I, I'm it, never it, like this, which I will never understand. Right? But never, like, never going to understand that. Or things like, for example, when there's any type of student loan forgiveness. Well, I had to pay all for mine, and I had to struggle. Okay, yeah, and so you want people hardship to struggle, for hardship yeah. for others, rather than you know what you've been through it, and you know what this was hard. I don't want anybody else to go through that, so I'm going to help with that. Right. Yeah. That, that that is that famous meme that goes around every now and then that I see pop up. You know, con, conservative is you know, if I'm if, if I'm not benefiting, I don't I don't want it. And then the liberal is well, you know, I don't want anybody else to have to go through this, so I'm going to help. Yeah, it's a, or something of the sort. It's a, the conservative, I think, is if it doesn't happen to me, I don't care. There the it is. Liberal that's is. The one. I don't want it to happen to anybody. So I do care. So I do care. Yeah. Yep. That's it. That's that's more precisely what I was looking. I was thinking of. So, um, please, if you are online, don't get discouraged. Online's not real life. There are lots of things going on that are there to make you lose your time. You can see that anytime you see like you know one of these short tweets that only have like one line or a line and a half, and it makes some type of bold statement. You know, like this is the most gov corrupt government in history. Do you agree? These are bait tweets. Yeah, they're literally bait tweets. They're they're literally existing. The most government current government in history. How dare you? This and then and then then you go off on the thing, and while you're tangoing with them, who are just laughing at the other end, saying, "Look, I got another sucker. I went fishing." You know, you're not actually delivering your message to people who will act, actually real people on social media who are willing to engage with it and hear it. Right. They want to distract you and pull you off message. And usually if they're coming after you, it's because you said something that's particularly true or particularly effective. And they don't want you talking about it. So they try to distract you and talk about other things. Often they'll try to get you to talk about your own behavior. Oh, yes. Like this. Well, all these, those stupid things, right? Like where you say, I like coffee. Oh, so you hate tea then? And then you go off onto that discussion, right? Which is you're no longer talking about coffee. You're talking about how you saying hating coffee doesn't mean, you know, you, you saying that you like coffee doesn't mean you hate tea. And then you're defending yourself of not being a tea hater and, you know, we're a tea oppressor. <laughs> so these are mindless things. You have to, you know, manage your mental health online when you see somebody just like come at you right off the bat and tearing a strip off to you or making assumptions about your character or your person. These are not real people. Most of the time, they're not real people. So you just ignore them and move on. Um, but yes, we are in a situation where some people are losing their minds about helping people uh, pay rent, about helping people save for a mortgage, about helping children learn on a full belly. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so long as social media, I think, is going to exist, we're going to have this type of dynamic where as soon as somebody says, you know, I don't know, I like O. Henry. Somebody's going to like lead some type of mob against you because you didn't you didn't say anything about Twix one way or another. <laughs> you know? so, I, I really enjoy a nice steak on a Friday evening for dinner. Well, oh, you hate animals? No, I didn't. It's not what I said. Yeah, well, we just saw it online, right? There was no good Friday message from the Prime Minister, not that I ever recognized any other time in my life where the Prime Minister had a good Friday message. So therefore, maybe there know, was, but the I've Prime Minister seen. hates Easter. Yes. Uh, yes. Transgender Day of Visibility happens to be on the 31st of March, whereas Easter is on what? The, the first Sunday after the full moon, after the vernal equinox. Yeah, so, so we played Easter roulette 
yes, we played Easter Roulette this year and it happened to fall on the 31st. Well, then, you know, it's not like, why can't we all just be friends? It's like, oh my God, you took your day on purpose and you should switch your date. Um, yeah, like that's going to happen. Um, you know, so you get this ridiculousness uh, all the time like this. And, you know, so you got this uh, faction here, for example, where they get upset when you say happy holidays and then you get to remembrance day and it's oh the prayers are dawn and nominational so they're canceling prayer and then you get to easter and this year in particular because there's you know different calendars and different faiths and they follow different some different things and some things happen like like we said you know the first sunday after the first full moon and that type of stuff so you know ramadan's not at the same time every year for example mm-hmm. Passover is not at the same time every year, for example. So you have multiple faiths celebrating something uh, around this time. This, and you know, somebody puts out a message, general message to everybody who's observing, and then says, "Oh, well, you didn't talk about us." So soon, we're going to get to a point where they're going to get upset that there isn't a Palm Sunday and a Shrove Tuesday and an Ash Wednesday and a Good Friday and an Easter Sunday. And an Easter Monday message. You have to be validated in every single one of them. Because it's or, the war on uh, The war on Christians. Christians. Yeah. No, yeah, it's the war on Christians. There's no more, there's no group more persecuted on the entire planet than Christians. That's literally. I think my Jewish brethren would belief. have something to say to you about that. <laughs> yeah. The indigenous peoples of this country. Yeah. I think they might have something to say about that. But Gay according to Daniel Uganda. Smith, uh, remember Daniel Smith with the unvaccinated were the most, oh my dear Lord. Gay people in uh, Uganda? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I'm just saying. You know, it's like, you, 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 the, your sense of your persecution is a little uh, exaggerated. Let's just yeah. put it that way. So, yes, Canada, famously white Christian ethno state. Says uh, Kit PNC Bio. <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah, you, the, you, this is going on, and um, I'm going to take some time to go into these announcements, I think, because um, I haven't yet. As you know, I'm busy with the show, so my <clears> time's <throat> a little limited in the evenings on show days. But uh, this is like the fourth now measure, yes. like re- related to housing or, or, or rental. Um, so this is uh, kind of important. Uh, you can tell that there's a theme. The prime minister was talking yesterday, and uh, um, it's very clear now that the theme of their budget is younger millennials mm-hmm. and younger people have trouble, you know, saving for home, uh, finding work, uh, coming out of school, uh, making ends meet, uh, you know, making sure that rent is covered and that type of stuff. So a lot of these announcements are ge- geared towards that demographic, uh, in particular. And it seems that it is a deliberate and a concerted strategy uh, with regard uh, to the prime minister here. But uh, with these, uh, because the first one was, um, the first announcement was on renting, and then the last few days we've had some announcements on housing. A lot of them are loan guarantee type programs. Um, And this one over here, According to iPolitics, iPolitics is the federal budget will earmark $1.5 billion to help preserve and create affordable housing units. It's the latest in a series of pre-budget housing announcements by the Liberals, who have eschewed tradition, of course, by preemptively unveiling key planks of the spending plan. Um, the plan is called the Canada Rental Protection Fund, which would provide $1 billion in loans and $470 million, $470 million in contributions to nonprofit groups and other partners to allow them to acquire rental units and keep their prices down. Um, because, uh, yeah, if, you, if you've been a non-for-profit, your operating costs have gone up a lot for the last few years, and uh, the fundraising to support that, uh, maybe not as much. Mm. And it's hard to be a not profit doing some good work if you don't have a headquarters. That would uh, stand to reason, yes. Yes. Um, Prime Minister Trudeau said, unfortunately, too many affordable housing units are under constant threat of being demolished to build condos or sold to speculators and large corporations that will increase rents at turnover. People are being priced out of their communities, and that's not okay. So we have to help nonprofits and community partners acquire units and preserve rents at a stable level. Um, so the fund would allow nonprofits to purchase affordable rental buildings when they go for sale instead of having them sold to a speculator or corporation that will look to increase profits uh, prices to generate profit. And the fund is supposed to roll out later this year. 
the Prime Minister pointed out to BC's Rental Protection Fund as an example of his government's plan, saying both were designed to retain affordable housing being lost to rent hikes after they were purchased by investors. Um, earlier this week, yeah, that's what we mentioned, Trudeau announced $15 billion top-up to the Federal Apartment Construction Loan Program and a new $6 billion Canada Housing Infrastructure Fund that would require provinces and municipalities to remove restrictive zoning rules. That's on top of a $400 million increase to the Housing Accelerator Fund, which provides money to municipalities that agree to zoning reforms and removing barriers to home construction. And that uh, $6 billion Canada Housing Infrastructure Fund, uh, that's uh, very important because often municipalities want to open up a new development to a certain neighborhood, but the sewage or wastewater systems are not there right. to support people living there. That particular fund, that particular $60 billion fund will go for that, those types of things, things okay. that need to do to get a neighborhood ready so that houses can be built and housing can be built on it uh, to help cities out. So the, they're thinking about this at every step of the process here. Uh, it's a, it seems to be a good, complete suite of packages. Um, so you could tell that uh, the federal government has put a lot of thought into this, which is a good, good. According to the new report from the RBC, uh, they say it's the toughest time ever to afford a home. As rising interest costs are making it harder to cover the bills, it found that Canadians... Uh, a Canadian making the median household income would need to spend 63.5% of their pay to cover the costs of owning an average home at market price. And I think the recommendation is that uh, that number is supposed to be about a third for a solid financial priming so that you're not mortgage poor, as they call it, uh, where you're living in your home, but all your disposable cash is going into just maintaining the home and you're not actually living. Mm -hmm. uh, you're living for your home. For all intents and purposes. A lot of house poor individuals across yeah. the country. Yeah. Bought more house than they could realistically afford and you know, live will live well beyond their means. That's just not an uncommon thing. It's mm -hmm. been going on for the last forty five years, I think. Yeah. It, it used to be more common when we used to do less stringent um, uh, mortgage testing. Right. Than we do now, since we had that crash in 2008, uh, the banks do uh, what's they got, called yeah. mortgage testing, where if you, you know, you're applying for a loan at the time that, uh, like I know when I was applying for mine, uh, you know, the rates were low, uh, but uh, they tested us at being able to pay a mortgage that I think was like three to four percent higher than what it was at the time to make sure that you know if something happened, we would uh, well um, that they, they, their investment also would be, you know, because and. Unlike um, most people would want to believe, banks don't actually like repossessing your home. No, they, that's the last thing they want to do, actually. Because it's like a lot of extra work for them and they don't get everything back and whatnot. They would much rather do extend your amortization period or do something. They will work with you. Stay. Because the last thing they want is to repossess a home. Like they really don't want to do it because it is um, not profitable for them. Cuts yep. into the margin. They have to get somebody to come in and help auction it off or remortgage it or sell it or whatever. The, it's a losing endeavor for them. So they don't want to do it. They will work extra hard to make sure you stay in your home. I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. They hmm. will do the extra thing, the, go the extra mile to make sure you stay in your home so that it's profitable for them. And it's not because they're doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. Nope. The bank is only interested in profiting for the bank. And They're not making friends. They only have interests. <laughs> but that's the thing. See, the bank will, will do what they can to keep you in the house because it's cheaper for them in the long run and more profitable for them because if they can keep you on, a, on, okay, we'll just extend your mortgage by another five years or whatever the case is. They will do whatever they can to keep you in that home. Yeah. Once they repossess it, it's just a royal pain in the ass for them that they do not want. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these loan programs are important because uh, you hear a lot of reports that over the last year, housing uh, slowed. The Federal Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation said in its Outlook report that it expects housing starts to drop in 2024 owing to supply challenges, quote, notably the lagged effects of higher interest rates. Um, when interest rates shoot up like they did, uh, 10, I think, uh, basis points increases over a short period of time. I think within a year. Um, some companies don't start building projects because the loans that they have to take out in order to get them off the ground, especially big apartment buildings, mm -hmm. um, 
they decide that they don't want to take on that cost. So a lot of these uh, loan funds that the federal government is uh, creating also address that. They allow these developers to get these loans that they would normally get for banks, but at a lower co- interest rate cost, which gives them incentive to actually take on the large development projects. Um, and uh, that's going to get a help, uh, a boost as well later this year when uh, the Bank of Canada starts um, lowering interest rates. Um, there are a few people that uh, think that it will happen on April 15th when they have the next meeting, but uh, the market consensus seems to be shifting more to uh, it might happen in July. and uh, might uh, even come uh, one month later because uh, the overall consensus seemed to be in June might be the first one. Some people that are uh, a little more enthusiastic claim April, but uh, given the recent good job numbers and good GDP numbers. Uh, Some people are thinking that might encourage the bank to wait uh, one more uh, period and uh, go until July. But the rates are, uh, the general consensus all around seems to be that they will come down a bit, which will also give a little boost uh, to these types of projects. And also to all Canadians who are uh, going to be renewing mortgages very soon. Uh, You'd rather do it at a lower interest rate, of course. Um, so yeah, you have, uh, conservatives of course are poo-pooing all over this eight years after Trudeau promised to lower the price of housing, rents and mortgages in Canada have doubled and middle-class Canadians are forced to live in tent encampments in nearly every city across Canada. Deputy conservative leader, Melissa Lansman, I don't know her, said in a statement, Trudeau's photo ops won't come anywhere close to building the 5.8 million homes that are needed to restore housing affordability for Canadians. Common sense conservatives will fire the gatekeepers and remove the bureaucracy to build the homes Canadians can't afford. She said, uh, don't ask her to take pictures, photographic evidence of houses being built, by the way. Uh She's not particularly good with a camera. Uh, Sorry, I, I had to. Mm. Miss Stock Photo 2020, Melissa Lansman. Um, Housing Minister Sean Fraser, who's intended for the announcement in Winnipeg, blamed the country's housing crisis on indifference from conservative and liberal governments over the past. Three decades prior to the introduction of the Trudeau's government national housing strategy in 2017, he has a point. We've done some episodes on this before with information based... uh, that came from the Wellesley Institute, showing how Prime Minister Byron Mulroney started cutting some money into the affordable housing, how the Kritzia and Martin government talked a good game about putting more money into housing, but didn't really do that because they were trying to uh, get uh, the finances back in order. And then how Stephen Harper came in and did announce some money at one point and did put the money in, but the way the money was allocated, most of it was going to uh, middle and high income people who already had uh, luxury or uh, very, very comfortable houses, but everything that was to the affordable housing sector got killed and whatever else, whatever was left uh, pretty much got decimated. Some programs being cut over 90% and some of them even 100%. And uh, around the time that Pierre Polyev claims he was housing minister, some of these programs were going through the system. So what he did was supervise the removal of this money from affordable housing contracts and projects rather than do anything, as Minister Fraser keeps reminding us that uh, Pierre um, supervised the construction of a total of six housing six. units the entire time he was allegedly housing minister. Yeah, six units. Six. six units, yes. Yes. <laughs> so he said the Liberals would publish a plan with their full suite of housing measures prior to this month's federal budget that would focus on spurring more housing construction and making it easier to rent or buy a place to live in this country. Um, well, Last week, the Prime Minister also announced a plan to create a renter's bill of rights that would, among other things, require landlords to disclose the pricing history for their apartments and create a national standard lease agreement. He also said the Liberals plan to provide $15 million in funding for provincial legal aid organizations to help defend tenants against unfair rent hikes, rent evictions, or illegal activity by landlords. Rent prices have surged in recent years, with the average price for a two-bedroom apartment in Canada hitting $2,350 last month, according to a report from Rentals.ca. The report says that rents in Canada have increased overall by a total of 21%, or $384 per month, from two years ago, just before the start of the interest rate hikes by the Bank of Canada. And of course, the budget will be tabled on the 16th of April. 
Uh, let's, let's stick with the budget here for a second. I got something for you from Deloitte. You know Deloitte, the accounting firm? Yes, yes. Canada likely to avoid recession, begin recovering in second half of 2024. Canada looks set to dodge a recession despite the ongoing downward pressure from higher interest rates, Deloitte Canada said in its economic outlook report. So, of course, that's uh, after eight years of Justin Trudeau, still no recession. That's after a world pandemic and two wars. The past conservative government ran back-to-back recessions without a world pandemic. Harper started out with a liberal surplus. Conservatives are not better with money. Proof is in the pudding right there. Yep. I'm, like, what can you say? It's mind-blowing. But again, it's like we said at the end of last year when we were doing our year-end retrospectives that one of the most underreported stories was the macroeconomic miracle here in Canada, that we got through all of that. Four years of Trump trying to kneecap us, two years of China trying to kneecap us, and then the global pandemic, when they're still coming out, coming out of it with a soft landing and no recession. Only one quarter that had a little bit, economic quarter that had a little bit of contraction. And even that one, I'm not sure if that got revised ultimately at the end. Once uh, the numbers came around, but uh, I saw another report the other day uh, insisting that we did and uh, indeed have at least one quarter of a very mild contraction. Um, and yesterday, as we uh, showed uh, with the former uh, parliamentary budget officer, uh, Kevin Page, uh, stating that there is no economic crisis. Like there really isn't. Not only comparing us to uh, like right where we are looking at the numbers right now, but comparing us to where we have been historically like where we were around the time uh, Chris and Martin decided that they needed to pull back on the reins and also comparing us to near peer countries and OECD countries because we are actually doing very well. Now, that doesn't mean that every single person individually on their kitchen table budget is doing well, but as a nation itself, we say that they're, they're driving us into the poorhouse, or they're going to destroy the economy. Like that, that's one of the things with the food program, right? It says, well, yeah, I guess after you deliberately try to destroy the economy so that people don't have any money, I guess you do have to feed them. It's like, no, he actually removed half a million kids off the poverty rolls right. way before any of this took place. So long, you know, long before the pandemic delivered the middle uh, the middle class tax cut in this first term and then the changes to the national child uh, program child benefits not the national child benefit uh, can can Canada child benefit sorry program that would leave even more money and then keeping people whole during covid with the $2000 serb which is way more than uh, welfare or disability supports offers people and then just there's been a whole suite of measures um, so for people to turn around and uh, say that uh, this government has deliberately tried to destroy the economy in order to get you over a barrel so that you would have to be thankful for their policies and vote for them um, that's actually a conservative shtick conservatives are the get you over a barrel political party and then they present you with the solution Oh, I'm sorry, these wait lists for these cancer screening is taking such a long time. Uh, yeah, I know it was much better before we came in. Times have slowed down. But uh, if you'd like to pay this guy over there, you can move to the front of the line. We have a solution for this problem that we created. Yeah. So... Oh, um, um, there's a, there's so the, a hole the, there that needs filling in. Let me dig another hole. I'll get some dirt for that. Yeah. yeah come on. Come on. So, yeah. 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 I know. I know. <laughs> I, I hear you, my friend. I hear you, my friend. Um, but that's the way the game is played. So actually, um, this article here from iPolitics uh, that I stumbled upon, uh, I'm actually going to put it here in the chat so that uh, kids can go look at it from themselves because uh, that actually contained the entire uh, synopsis of uh, all the measures taken to date. I said that I was going to research it and uh, bring it to oh, you, but God. it turns out that I happened to stumble on the article that had it all for you. Uh, so please take a look at that because uh, when you look at the those suite of measures all together, 
as one component. You can see that there's an actual concerted strategy that has been uh, developed and that is uh, being put into place. Hopefully, it will be put into place and start to have results early enough prior to the next election that people will start to see. Because that's the big uh, thing with the liberal government. Uh, what uh, Sean Fraser is doing is great, and there will be a certain number of units built before the next election uh, because he's starting now. But of course, you know, had they started four years ago, there would be a whole lot more to show for it. There's, the, the, the federal government has, has a good strategy right now, but they're limited at the back end by how much they can get done prior to the, fact, prior to the time we vote. So, um, because a lot of these projects are like, you know, 10-year funds and, this, you know, in 10 years we all have built something, yeah, well, that, that's great, but you're only government for another 18 months right now. Yeah, yeah. So, um, that's the one of the reasons why, started yeah, now. yeah, get, get them started now. But uh, that's one of the reasons uh, when we come to vote uh, next time around, uh, a lot of these things are being put into place if you want them to continue. You can't change horses in the middle of this race mm -hmm. because the other party has expressed no interest whatsoever in maintaining these things. Well, and, and if we address some of the other ongoing issues right now, the carbon tax, of course, with the conservatives constantly harping on about X, the tax. I just saw a couple of posts here that uh, I'll quickly show you one of you, one of them on screen, and then we'll discuss the other thing. And, and discuss what the crux of the matter is. So here's the first one. This is from uh, Barney Panofsky's Best Intentions. My name's not Gordy. Outrageous. Just got my cell phone bill for the month and the carbon tax charge on it is over $870 as the copy of my invoice below proves. <laughs> monthly, monthly cell phone bill. Monthly service charge is $122.37. Carbin, C-A-R-B-I-N, tax charges, eight seventy seven. dollars Total charge is $9.99. <laughs> He's making complete fun of it all, right? Yeah, well, that's what I've said. I pointed out the gas bills like that where they're saying that their carbon fee is exceeds their gas delivery charge or the price of their gas. And it's like, dude, I can assure you that gas is more than $80 per ton. <laughs> Just the carbon on the gas is $80 per ton. I'm sure the gas itself per ton is way more. So... But, and again, the the that hotel bill where somebody had like yes. a forty dollar breakfast at a luxury hotel and said, "I can't believe this." This is clearly uh, these are fake memes. Yes, the, just these the, are bait. Just to drive a narrative, so he drove one that was extra crazy. And and here's another one from uh, my name's not Gordy. This this and this one though is is anchored in reality. This is the best part. Conservatives, the carbon tax increases the cost of living. Life is less affordable. Scott Moe, so yeah, to own the libs, we're going to have a provincial carbon tax, but with no rebates. Conservatives, um, wait a second here. This actually legitimately happened because, you know, Scott Moe says the, the carbon tax is too expensive. We need to get rid of it. This liberal the carbon tax. So the province of Saskatchewan's come up with one of their own, but you don't get a rebate. You just pay into it. Yep. So you, how, how quickly you want to that tax, right? Yeah. Well, see, the thing is, with this one, right, um, Scott Moe has been railing against a carbon tax mm -hmm. for the longest time. Yeah. Right. He even, like I said, we just showed him you know, demanding time at parliamentary committees and actually going to a parliamentary committee and making the claim right, that it was like killing him. Because, and meanwhile, you've been hearing him talking about uh, in the lead up to this, well, you know, if we're not going to collect the money and we're not going to remit it to the federal government and the federal government's not going to give people from Saskatchewan their rebates back, well, that's unfair. So then he puts in place some carbon things, some carbon pricing, and doesn't give a rebate. So he wants a rebate for the federal government for the people that he's not willing to give himself. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of things going on over here. Because, but one of the things that I found interesting about this is that if Scott Moe is looking to do this, uh, 
then Scott Moe is very well aware that he needs to remit that money to the federal government when he says he's not going to charge it to the citizens. And this is a way to do it. He's collecting that money. He has the funds. He could take it. He could ship it to the federal government. And it doesn't hurt his coffers anymore. Mm -hmm. But it yeah. does hurt other people's coffers, though, because as we mentioned, if Scott Moe does this thing where he doesn't charge it to the people, but he still has to give the money back to the federal government, it's coming from another line in the budget, which means that you as taxpayers in Saskatchewan, you actually are paying it. It's just now a hidden tax. Yeah. Rather than one you see. And also... It does, is it removes one of the actual conservative elements of the tax, which is you getting to decide how much mm -hmm. you pay. See, when they're telling you how much this is an incentive, one, the fact that if you make like under something like $200,000 a year or something, you're, you're probably better off. Yes. So that plus making a decision to consume less carbon by either driving less or changing to a heat pump or whatnot. Add both amounts together, ding, 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 that's incentive. Mm -hmm. How does it change behavior? That's how it changes behavior. Hey, I'm the government and I'm giving you an option on how much tax you get to pay. Would you like to pay less tax? You can. Make better decisions. Yeah. <laughs> it literally is. <laughs> You know, it is it, so freaking conservative. Yeah. Yeah. Because small c conservative. When I talk, when I say conservative, this, this program, the inherent principles are entirely conservative. Well, it's, it's like the GST when that first came in. People were, because I was in selling AV back then and I had people asking me, is it going to be, prices are going to go up, prices are going to go down. And I said, honestly, it looks like prices are going to go down. Really? Why? Yeah. Well, the 12% hidden manufacturing tax is removed. So it's going to go down by 5%. Like, what? Well, yeah, there's this manufacturing tax of 12% that is now removed because GST is applied on everything. It's a 7% tax. So from 12 to 7, the difference is 5. You're saving 5%. But nobody wants to pay the GST. Okay, but you were already paying a tax that you didn't know was there. So now you can see where your money's going. No. <laughs> yep. You're, you're right about that, though, Jim. They removed the 12% and increased the profit margin. In many cases, prices didn't yes. go down. They yes. stayed exactly the same. And there was yes. a 5% jump in the margin for, for a lot of people. But in the end, it, it didn't cost you anything more to buy a television or a stereo back in, what, 1990. Was it 90, 90, 93, I think it was when it came in, yep. wasn't it? Yeah, it's yep. 31 years ago. Yep. Oh my God. So um, here's the, the thing with this that's really hard to believe. Um, so you have the conservative line about the carbon, about carbon pricing the entire time has been that the cons liberal governments have put in place a tax grab. It's a tax grab. Yes. And the liberal government has proven by going to Supreme Court that one uh, number one, it's not a tax because it doesn't behave like a tax. And it's not a tax because all of the funds are actually used and remitted. They don't go into, right? So you have the 80% of people that are better off, and then you have you know, both emitting programs and a certain amount of money is taken aside to help hospitals and schools and all that type of stuff uh, do their, uh, make their change, and then the rest of them goes into the funds and gets redistributed. So it's not a tax. It actually is regulatory fee and actually behaves like a regulatory fee. Um, all the money is remitted. So it's not, a, it literally is the opposite of a tax grab. You know, yes. It is an income redistribution scheme in the sense that, yes, there's money being taken from one source and there creates a pot and some goes to different light items, helping people that don't have. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, for example, people that live in more faraway regions get a top up to that amount because, you know, 
the public transit systems for their their for them to make better choices or to make less expensive choices do not exist for them exactly. or travel distances are longer. So this program even recognizes that. Um, but it seems that uh, for the province of Saskatchewan, uh, they're expecting, and this is according to the Regina Leader Post, $326.3 million to be generated by the provincially collected it's called output based performance standards. So if you're looking for things on a budget and you're saying, is my government charging me a carbon tax? Mm -hmm. There's no line on the budget that actually says carbon tax no. or carbon pricing. It's called output based performance standards, OBPP, OBPS. That's what you need to find. Talk about a way of keeping it hidden from you. So. They've collected $326.3 million, sorry, they're expecting $326.3 million to be generated by uh, this system from electrical production alone. In total for 2024-2025, the OBPS is supposed to bring in $351.3 million according to the recently released budget. So $326.3 million of the $351.3 million dollars expected to be generated in 2024, 2025 is going to come from electrical production alone. That's the day. And here's the, the kicker. This is third paragraph in this article. Quote, a day after Premier Scott Moe called for the federal carbon tax to be scrapped, he acknowledged the OBPS is a carbon tax by another name. <laughs> Shakespeare would be so proud. A, a carbon tax name. by any other name yes. pulls food out of your mouth and prevents you from paying your mortgage just as much. Doesn't it? He actually admitted. So this OBPS thing has been in place since 2019. Scott Moe has been collecting a carbon tax on Saskatchewan residents since 2019. That's five and years. And not giving folks. them a remake. Oh. It's fine. He found years. out. And yesterday he finally admitted. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, well the OBPS actually is a carbon tax. All that thing I said was gonna curve your spine and starve your children and ruin your life and destroy the Canadian. Yeah, I've been doing it for the last five years. Except it's been a little amount. Right? Because if next year it's gonna be three hundred and twenty six out of three hundred and fifty one, that means only twenty five million of that. Twenty five million of that amount was the stuff on which he was charging that carbon tax before. So it was a, it was a small carbon tax. It wasn't applying to a lot of things, but there was one, and it was bringing in about $25 million. Now he's going to have $326 million come in. Why does he need that much more money all of a sudden coming into the OBPS? Maybe because he doesn't want to go to jail. So he needs a fund of money to be able to remit all that money he was collecting before. So this is just a sleight of hand that's going on here. Quote Mo, it is a carbon tax, but what we would say is remove it. It needs to be removed. Changing who's charging, it doesn't help a thing. Um, dude, it's your tax. It was created in 2019. You were premier there. What do you mean? It's like, it needs to be removed. You're the one who put it there. And then you grew it. <laughs> yeah. And now you're sitting in front of a camera going, it needs to be removed, changing who's charging. You're the one who's charging. Yeah, that thing I did that I tried to pretend that I didn't do, that I hid from you, when it cost you more money. It, I'm, yeah. At yeah, the same time, I'm, the province wants to improve the electrical grid while getting into new means of power generation with the money collected from OBPS, which is earmarked to go towards the province's pursuit of small modular nuclear reactions. So it's a fund that they have plans to reinvest the money in to technologies that would be a little greener. Which is the exact same thing the Climate Fund federally is doing. That five thousand dollars I'm going to get from my heat pump when they come in and they do that inspection and realize that our, our GHDs are down. Where do you think that money's coming from? Mm. Hello, because <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Part of it will go into an investment for quite likely nuclear reactors into the future so we can replace some of our generation capacity, said Mo. Most of the money is going into three funds. $70.4 million will go to the tech fund, which will get money from non-electricity sector payments. The annual clean electricity transition grant, which will be given back to Sask Power, receives $140 million. And the Small Modular Reaction Investment Fund, or SMRIF, which will also receive money from electricity sector revenues, receives $140.9 million. However, the SMRIF money is, quote, not being expensed in this year's budget, according to a government communications person. So not only are they not spending, they're collecting the money, but they're not actually spending it this year. They're actually building the fund yeah. so that they can spend it later. On what, though? Yes. What are they well, they, they they say it's on small nuclear reactors and that type of thing, but we'll we'll, we'll see that, right? Brent Dolter, assistant professor in economics at the University of Regina, explains the pricing regime as giving quote the large emitters some free runway, thinking of them as pollution permits, so you can pollute up to a certain level without paying. And I believe the federal program works similarly, that uh, up until a certain point you're not charged, and then everything after a certain amount you are charged. So they're not being charged on their full output, only their output after a, a certain amount. Um, after a certain, so yes, uh, the OPPS system has been in action since 2019, but recently Sask Power was added to the scope of the tax. And this is the thing uh, that is new here. Um, um, Effective to January 1st, 2023, the electricity sector has recently been added to the provincial OBPS in place of the federal carbon tax. So what this sentence means is that on January 1st, 2023, well over a year ago, the mm -hmm. government of Saskatchewan changed the OBPS rules, the output-based performance standard rules, to include the electrical sector, which will now count for $326 million of the $351 million that OBPS is going to raise. He quietly added the electricity sector to that over a year ago. And over the entire last year, he's been claiming about people not being able to afford energy costs. I, I, he actually put electricity fees under his own provincial carbon tax 16 months ago and went around the whole country pretending like he never did that. Uh, <laughs> I need a coffee. You're getting screwed, Saskatchewan. You're getting screwed. And, and, Just like and Albertans got screwed when Danielle Smith said that she was going to do an energy rebate. And then she got into power and says, oh, no, no, sorry. That was just a deferral. And yeah. then she's going all around and talking about people can't afford their energy when we found out that she changed the caps. Yeah. Yeah. That's why. Because that people are paying 128% more. So now she's patting herself on the back. Yeah, it's time for Albertans to pay less for energy. No, no, it was time for Albertans to pay less for energy before you raised it 128% over the course of one year. Now it's really time. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, it's, I'm going to lower your energy rates, but first let me raise them 128%. It's okay. Don't worry about it. It'll look good when I take that money. You know, when, when I reduce them, it'll look great. But wait a minute, I'm still paying more no matter what. And meanwhile, in Saskatchewan, the carbon tax is terrible. That's why I'm going to charge you a carbon tax on your electricity. Yeah. The federal government is horrible for making you pay carbon tax on your electricity. That should be my job. Well, the prime minister agrees. That's why the program was designed with, hey, you know what? If you want to do it made in your province so that the money stays in your province and you get to control what you do with the money. But more and more and more, we are getting the message, and it's becoming very clear that conservatives have no problem with carbon taxation. No, 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 no. They just have a problem with you getting the rebate. This was never, ever, ever about affordability oh, God, for these no. premiers. It was about control. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the housing money. Okay, well, we're going to go directly to municipalities. No, not like that. The money has to come through us. This is the exact same thing. 
How dare you be giving rebates directly back to the people? That money should be coming to us. Well, yes, the federal the federal government agreed. That's why they asked you to make your own made made in product problem solution. <laughs> Quebecers don't receive a rebate. No. British Columbians do, but that's because their provincial system has decided that they would do that. But there's no rebate to Quebecers under the cap and trade program. Nope. And we had a program here in Ontario. With the and cap there was no trade. rebate to us either. And it was cancelled. Yeah. And it was cancelled. So, uh, I don't know, man. I don't know. But yeah. So yeah, Scott Moe actually uh, believes in carbon taxes. Um, yeah, province? He just doesn't want rebates, and, and he has to own the libs. <laughs> yep, indeed, indeed. Uh, the budget... And here's the other thing about keeping it hidden. The budget was the first time OBPS payments were displayed or noticed, noted as a line item despite existing since 2019. So they've had it hidden for five years. Yeah. You know, when I mentioned that you have to look for OBPS on the budget mm -hmm. line item, yeah. 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, you couldn't find it. It wasn't there. It only started appearing in 2023. Funny how that works out, huh? And then they didn't list it as carbon. They listed it as OBPS, hoping you wouldn't notice. Of course. So if you're in Saskatchewan right now and you hate listening to us, or if you're in Saskatchewan and you, you are love listening to us, but you know people who are screaming, you probably want to let those people know, screaming, know that uh, Mo, uh, without their consent and without their knowledge, uh, flipped them over. And uh, didn't use lube before he screwed them. This is true. I do not understand how you can be against a carbon tax while you are imposing one and trying to hide it. Yeah. This man is dishonest. To say the least. He's inherently dishonest. This budget, so that was the first time it appeared. Let's see what it else. The province explained that the OBPS system is a means to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from large-scale polluters while maintaining economic competitiveness. It also aims to minimize the risk of missing out on green and sustainable technology investment and development to other jurisdictions. Hello, carbon tariffs. They're literally at all the things that we've been saying for years. They're admitting them. We've looked at other ways, but it was too costly. Yes, because carbon pricing is the least effective, is the, sorry, the most effective and least costly way. It is an inherently conservative way of doing it that creates the least amount of bureaucracy. We've been saying that for years. Yeah. There is no better way. And then you admitted it on the stand. And then we said, you need to take care of your own stuff when you're talking about like wanting to reduce global emissions and helping people in Iran and all those other places reduce how much they, they generate and getting credit for it rather than doing something over here. No, you have to reduce them over here or else you're going to have trouble selling your product. Mm -hmm. this, you are going to have trouble inter attracting international investment. These are all things that we've been talking about for years. And they kept on saying, no, 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 no. Well, it turns out, yes, 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 yes. And they know it's true. Because they're making little decisions quietly to adapt them. So while they're screaming, no, 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 they're actually doing so. I guess the upside is that they actually are doing some of the work. They just don't want the credit for it. <laughs> it's just wow. no votes in it. I guess I mean if you're looking for a civil aligning, they are doing some of the work and are recognized and but this is how you know that they do know that this work needs to be done mm -hmm. and that this is all posing and preening and posturing. But they are still doing the work because they know down the line not being able to export that damn potash in the first place is gonna be a way more of a political ball and chain around the ankle. Oh, yeah. carbon pricing for them. Um, quote, 
ultimately we need to drive the emissions out of that sector in a responsible way. And so we're going to run the life cycle out of the assets that we have, but need to prepare for the significant investments that are coming said mo. So basically the stuff that we have, we want to run them into the ground, which I can understand. Mm -hmm. You put a lot of money in it. OBPS compliance payments made by the electricity sector, primarily SASC power, are deposited. You know where they're deposited? In the general revenue fund. Wow. So they can spend it on anything and will uh, and will be dedicated entirely to priorities that help manage an affordable and reliable clean electricity transition. Wink. Believe me. I got you. I got you covered. I got you covered. Hi. I am the premier from Saskatchewan, and carbon tax money that I've been raising secretly and not telling you about, believe me when I say that all of it, it will be dedicated entirely to priorities that help manage an affordable and reliable clean electricity transition. And would you be interested in some oceanfront property on the north coast of our province? Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. I'm sorry. See, this is where you have a problem. Where if your whole persona politically is being the anti-carbon person, then when you turn around and you say, hey, no, no, don't worry. It will be entirely dedicated to help manage affordable and reliable clean electricity transition. I don't believe you. Well, there's a good reason for that. There's little inconsistency here. Mm-hmm. The thing. Uh, Dolter, and here's where we have, so you have this type of, you've got Scott Mo saying, you know, don't worry, it's all going to go to there. But Brett Dolter, who is an assistant professor in economics at the University of Regina, says, um, actually, the money could go to address the deficit. But setting aside for specific energy projects is a worthwhile endeavor. A government spokesperson said the OPPS money did technically offset the deficit. Especially the, that money that uh, was taken from the fund that was supposed to be directed to a uh, small nuclear reactors, but is not going to be expensed in the coming year. Mm. We have an extra $140 million just sitting here because that we're not going to spend this year. But, you know, should our budget make a shortfall of $100,000? Well, that hundred or $100 million, that $140 million is on the book. So it looks like we... Uh, balanced our budget and had a little surplus going into an election year. The guy's as dishonest as the day is long, man. (laughs) Uh, Quote, it helps keep electricity rates lower than they would otherwise be as we move to a net zero grid by 2050. Lower income households benefit when electricity rates are kept lower because they spend a larger portion of their incomes on electricity bills, said Dolter. The Minister of Environment, Christine Tell, speaking Tuesday, said the whole OBPS system is a way to, quote, to help industry and help the people of the province also. Tell says she hopes through the industrial emitters contributing to the tech fund, it's all about technology. Her hope is the fund will be used to, quote, to hopefully create technology that reduces our emissions. So again, I want you to listen to that sentence. It's all about technology. Her hope is the fund will use use to, quote, to hopefully create technology that reduces our emissions. So again, when the conservatives are saying technology, not taxes, what they mean is technology that we hope will come along to reduce our emissions, not taxes. Because the technology isn't actually there yet. It doesn't exist. It hasn't been upscaled and it is not deployable on a large scale. And we don't know if it ever will be. They've been working Tech- to try and come up with small nuclear reactors for decades. It's not there. Technology that I'm crossing my fingers may come around one day so that I don't actually have to make a tough decision and do the work. Mm-hmm. I gotta grab a coffee. I'll be right back. <laughs> yep. So there you go. Conservatives love carbon taxes. They're the ones that brought the idea to us originally. Stephen Harper had announced one that was going to be put into place. The provincial government in British Columbia at the time, which identified under the liberal banner but was really a conservative government, brought the first one in all across the country. 
And now it seems that even Premier Scott Moe thinks the idea is so good that he had one going on for five years already. And last year, he decided to really juice it up. Ah, oh, man. <laughs> These people. Ah, Jazzy's here. Hello, Jazzy. Lovely. Thank you for joining us here. Oh, so you got the morning grumps. Well, hopefully I can be silly enough and help you turn your uh, that frown upside down a bit. <laughs> it's Friday. You got a weekend coming. I hope you have some great plans. <laughs> so, ooh. Oh, Cassie. No, Cassie, I have 50 days to go to until off my farm job. Are you retiring, Kid Cassie? If so, uh, congratulations and uh, well earned indeed. So, yeah. So we have some housing stuff. We have carbon stuff for you. Um, a little hypocrisy along the way uh, on the carbon stuff and uh, some good things on the housing uh, front. Um, other things uh, that are happening um, at the moment is, um, uh, I guess we should talk a little bit about, uh, I'm trying to think here. I don't know if I want to go into Israel right now. Let's skip over um, Israel we have for the time being. I, well, I, I, there, there have some been, been some really, really big developments, however. Mm. Um, yeah, let's try this here. Um, so Jacob Flickinger, uh, the Canadian who passed away, mm -hmm. uh, turns out was also a former member of the Canadian Forces. He was a retired Master Corporal, and he left behind a wife and an 18-month-old son. Um as a result of the attack, the United Nations suspended its nighttime movements in Gaza because the strike on the convoy did happen at night. A uh, U.S.-based group called Anera has also decided to suspend aid activities. Other groups have as well. Uh, some other groups have announced that they might be restarting their activities uh, today. Um, in addition to the 42 million meals that uh, Central World Kitchen uh, World Central Kitchen, sorry, has delivered in Gaza. It has also delivered 1.75 mi million meals in Israel itself. Um, and uh, it's not like just one side has been attacking uh, World Central Kitchen. Uh, Hamas has held members uh, of the organization for questioning uh, during the conflict uh, on a couple of occasions as well. Um, when... President Joe Biden says that this is not a standalone incident. Uh, he is correct. The UK-based group uh, Medical Aid for Palestinians uh, chimed in uh, a couple of days ago saying that they had uh, uh, encountered um, a situation in which an Israeli missile hit a staff housing complex even after the military told them that they were in a safe zone. Um, the reason why the claims from Israel that uh, this was an error uh, are less and less believable, it's not believable. Uh, stem from the fact that the three-car convoy had pre-cleared its route and shared right. its movements with Israel's military. So the founder of World Central Kitchen, Jose Andres, says that he's skeptical of Israel's claims that the attack was uh, unintentional. Quote, he says, what I know is that we were targeted deliberately non-stop until everybody was dead in this convoy. Uh, Israel has offered a blanket apology for the deaths and said that a new command center to deal with the aid is coming. Uh, the meeting with officials from Israel and officials from Washington, D.C. that had been canceled by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in protest um, had uh, happened by Zoom. Uh, or at least uh, by online call. I don't know if it was Zoom specifically, uh, but uh, it did take place. It was roughly two and a half hours long. It was described as constructive and productive. 
with follow-up talks having been agreed to, and some of them may actually be taking place in person. It seems that uh, the Netanyahu administration was presented with a menu of options, and that which appealed to them most was a proposal that would help them disrupt the leadership of Hamas uh, by either capturing or removing, uh, which is means assassinating them when they talk about removing, uh, in the form of a targeted air campaign combined with realignment operations. Um, there was also, uh, a couple of days ago, an Iranian diplomatic outpost that was hit. And uh, a lot of uh, people in Iran suspect that it is the government of Israel that has done this. And uh, the United States has done something a little interesting in that uh, it has indicated with much greater clarity than it usually does to the government of Iran that they had nothing to do with hitting that diplomatic outpost. It wasn't just of like, we didn't do it. It was like there with like proof and that type of stuff. So uh, there is a massive effort, uh, again, to try to contain the skirmish or just uh, the battles or the fights to one region and not to get other players involved in it. And uh, uh, I guess there are some questions as to whether or not uh, there are some factions, uh, even maybe within Israel, trying to goad Iran to enter the fray in some way. Uh, it seems that there are other decisions that are being made as well in Israel. Uh, for example, they are looking to um, curtail the activities of international broadcasters uh, that are producing content that the government says threatens national security. This is mostly aimed at Al Jazeera. Um, they're basically, and Israel is basically going to block Al Jazeera from broadcasting any way, shape, or form within Israel. Uh, but yes, that's a sign that you're doing really well as a government when you're going to try and ban international news organizations from actually reporting on it. That usually sends a high sign of confidence that you're doing things that are completely above board. Um, a group of angry protesters had disrupted the visitors' uh, gallery in the Neset. Hamas uh, took 253 people hostage, but 130 have not yet been released. And this is causing uh, major protests uh, to be happening on the streets of uh, Israel. Uh, tens of thousands of people are protesting the fact that hostages have not been returned and that the government's doing a poor job at getting them back. And uh, interestingly enough, a member of the war cabinet, Benny Gantz, who's more to the right, mm -hmm. I believe, than is Netanyahu, has been calling for early elections, saying that new elections would renew the public's faith in the government. Would it now? Yeah. I'm not sure that that's uh, the case actually here. Um, now, there has been more reaction here uh, with uh, regard to the United States. The national security spokesperson, John Kirby, is on the record as saying after this conversation yesterday, if there is no changes to their policy and their approaches, then there's going to have to be changes to ours. Uh, that meeting with officials was followed by a 30-minute phone call between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu, where they contact, talked to each other directly and uh, said uh, uh, President Biden made it very clear that new concrete and specific measures to get food to starving Palestinians in Gaza to reduce civilian bloodshed and protect aid workers are expected within hours and days. Israel's military seems to have gotten the message because they've announced that they will be opening up a few more corridors to get aid into Gaza and that that will happen very soon. Uh, with regard to our prime minister, because there is a, a Canadian-American citizen said Jacob Flickinger, and we talked about earlier when we started this section, who has died, um, is not having it. He is quoted as saying, I have to directly take issue with what Prime Minister Netanyahu said yesterday when he said, well, this is just happens in conflicts and in wartime. Uh, no, it doesn't just happen, and it shouldn't just happen. When you have aid workers for an extraordinary organization like World Central Kitchen risking their lives every day in an incredibly dangerous place to deliver food to people who are experiencing the horrific humanitarian catastrophe, that is not okay that they get hit by targeted missiles like this. It's calling for an open and independent invest investigation into what happened. So those are the latest developments uh, on that front. Um, 
I guess the now that the United States has said jump and we need to look to see if the Netanyahu government has actually said how high and is willing to do that. But um, uh, Israel's longtime allies are losing patience with it. And uh, it's not necessarily guaranteed. Um, if Israel goes into new elections and an even more harder right-wing faction would happen to be winning, um, this situation would only get worse. Oh, yeah. So uh, Netanyahu is not helpful to the situation, but he's still remotely more moderate than certain people in this cabinet. Um, and it's one of those be careful what you wish for situations you want to replace the current leader, but uh, you don't get a guarantee that you get the a leader that will be more conciliatory next. So I'm not really not sure what the situation is there. I mean, it's like I said, it's very clear that Netanyahu is not productive and not helpful. But the problem is, is that there are many, 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 many worse options. Oh yes. And if there were elections, they would definitely be competing because for them, this is their moment. If they wanted to rid Palestine of Palestinians, this is their moment. They're running their end game now. Yep, Kitsasi allies have been too reluctant to be tough on Israel, and now we are saying that was a bad idea. This is also the concern the next person may be worse, and Netanyahu will likely put that person there. Possibly, uh, that would probably require some type of guarantees that his ass remains out of jail. Because, you know, that's what a lot of this is about, right? He thought if, if he could be a wartime prime minister that people would forget all about the past stuff. And, well, it turns out he's not a particularly good wartime leader. No. So people are not impressed. They weren't impressed with him before this started, and they're not impressed with him now. Oh, what is the, the headline? Stay right tuned. The, from the Globe and Mail. Airstrikes on aid workers don't just happen. Trudeau says after Netanyahu comments. Yep. So that, uh, you know, the, the amount of people said, Trudeau won't say a damn thing about this. Well, that aged well, didn't it? <laughs> yep. He directly called him out saying this was a targeted attack. They don't just happen. There's yep. a chain of command it has to go through. They knew exactly where they were, where they would be. There's several people involved. And you don't pull the trigger until you're told you can do so. So there's a chain of command in here that needs to be investigated. But I guarantee you, that was intentional. It was oh, yeah. intentional. There's no two ways about it. No. It, it can't be otherwise. No. It just can't be. Um, there are two big events uh, that happened this week. Uh, first... It is the 75th anniversary of the formation of NATO. Mm -hmm. So 75 years ago, I think, was yesterday. Um, NATO has grown from its initial 12 members. Of course, NATO started after the Second World War uh, as an alliance. Um, and uh, over time, seems to have been uh, morphed into a standing against uh, Russia, uh, specifically. Um, Type of thing. It always had a basis with that because we had the Warsaw Pact and we had NATO back then. And back then, and the Warsaw Pact seems to have pretty much dissolved for all intents and purposes. But NATO remained, and you know has been trying to find other purposes uh, to justify its existence. And uh, then when Russia went into Ukraine, it's almost like its uh, original mandate <laughs> kind of came back again. Um, but yes, it's now grown to thirty-two members with the recent additions of Finland and Sweden, who's a mm -hmm. uh, memberships have been approved. Um, NATO foreign ministers have agreed to, uh, to take over the coordination of delivery of weapons and munitions to Kiev. Um, this is uh, in preparation for a potential, um, um, the possibility of Donald Trump too, as president of the United States. Um, of course, uh, the US president at the time that uh, NATO was formed was uh, Harry Truman. Mm -hmm. And the goal has been to get uh, countries to spend 2% of their GDP 
Uh, on defense, at the present moment, Canada spends 1.38%, which is higher than it was under Harper, but uh, very close, uh, to, uh, very far still from 2%. Yes. We actually have two things like that. Uh, the, the NATO one two percent and zero point seven percent of GDP for our foreign aid. Mm -hmm. um, we've never reached those targets ever, as Elizabeth Bay mentioned in her tribute to Brian Mulroney. Under him, was the closest that we got to the zero point seven percent on uh, foreign aid. Uh, but those are uh, two things uh, on the the world scene where, um, like, I know that when we're called upon, we always showed up. Yes, and uh, and that's why we get a lot of leeway. Mm -hmm. By not reaching the zero point seven percent target or the two percent target, well, we always punch needed, well above our weight too yes. when asked to step in, right? Yeah, but um, uh, yeah, these are commitments that we've made to the world and that we've never actually respected once. Yeah, it's true. It, it, it goes to our international reputation. Well, you, you can't skirt around it. It does go to our international reputa reputation. Speaking of international, this is from oh. this was posted four hours ago on the CBC. India, Pakistan attempted to interfere in Canada's elections, according to CSIS. Uh, spy, agency, uh, spy agency documents table that foreign interfer interference inquiry show 2019 and 2021 elections were targeted. This was released late last night, four, well, four hours ago, so this morning, I guess, early this morning. Government of Pakistan officials in Canada attempted to clandestinely influence Canadian federal politics with the aim of furthering the government of Pakistan's interest in Canada in 2019. 2021, the government in, of India had intent to interfere and likely conducted clandestine activities from CSIS. Okay. Um, that's probably revelations that are going to be uh, coming up in uh, the foreign interference. Yes. Um, but before we go into that, because I mentioned we had two things that we were celebrating. Um, the second uh, uh, occasion that we are celebrating is the fact that uh, Nunavut on April 1st became a full-fledged territory, mm. and that was 25 years ago. That was 25 years ago? Holy shit. 25 years ago, April 1st, 1999. Um, wow. PJ Akiaguk, who was a teenager in a tiny hamlet on the tip of Ellesmere Island, watching with anticipation when Nunavut was officially born, and I believe is the the current no or what has been a premier i'm not sure if he's the current one mm -hmm. um but he's quoted as saying there was so much excitement so much optimism in the air when he was recalling uh the day when um basically the eastern half of the old northwest territories was uh, determined to be nunavut so that inuit canadians uh would have or Inu Canadians in this case? Inuk, Inuk. Inuk Canadians, yes. Inuk Canadians would have a territory of their own. Uh, quote, but we weren't sure what it really was. I was young at the time, but there was something special going on, he said. Um, at the time, Akiagok thought he would become a water truck driver. Quote, I had no idea at the time, obviously, that I would become premier one day. Mm -hmm. Now, he's a young premier. He's only 39 years old. He says it's an immense responsibility and privilege to continue steering the territory towards the vision behind Nunavut's formation. So he is the current premier here. Uh, the creation of Nunavut, which means our land in Inuktitut, was part of a land claim settlement, the first major change to Canada's map since Newfoundland and Labrador joined Confederation in 1949. It extends from the 60th, 60th parallel to the northern coast of Ellesmere Island, about one-fifth of Canada's land mass. After more than a decade of negotiation, the Nunavut Act and the Nunavut Lands Claim Agreement Act received royal assent in 1993. Residents celebrate Nunavut Day every July to mark the passing of the legislation that promised the new territory and public government. Um, Solomon Awa remembers that he was out hunting in Pond Inlet, a small community on northern Baffert Island, when the territory came into existence six years later. Once the hunt was over, the impact of what was going on started to sink in. Quote, we have our own government territory government, Awa said. A quarter of a century later, he is the mayor of Iqaluit, the territory's capital city, and a lot has changed in that time, mm -hmm. and including Apra. He says that the city is growing uh, rapidly. Nunavut's population, about 85% of it Inuit, has been steadily increasing. It's now more than 40,000 people from fewer than 30,000 in 1999, so it's grown by a full uh, third in Great. 25 years. Um, I remember the work when... Sorry, I was going to say, when, when Nunavut was first uh, formed, I remember watching a comedian uh, at the Winnipeg Comedy Fest, and he's Inuk, 
and he, he said, you know, uh, we, we went to the government and said we would like to get our land back. And the government said, yeah, you'll get none of it. <laughs> but I'm da -da 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 -da. The work of Nunavut's uh, forebearers and the progress of the last 25 years were celebrated with fireworks, entertainment, and a cultural showcase. On Monday, Governor General Mary Simon was in attendance. Of course, she would be for that type of thing. Um, talking about the future, of course, they say it doesn't come without challenges. Uh, both uh, leaders uh, say that housing in the territory is at a crisis. Mm. There's long been issues with overcrowded housing in the territory, which has worsened with population growth and workers coming in for jobs. Inadequate housing is also linked to other issues like poor education outcomes and health problems, including increased risk of suicide. Um, the premier is certain uh, that uh, the territory as determination and spirit will ensure that things continue to improve. And he often thinks of advice he received from those who helped create the territory, which is be grounded. Quote, have that long-term vision and not to make swift, quick changes of the flavor of the day. Just always lives up, just always live up to the imagination of what the Nunavut agreement was to become. And uh, lots uh, from uh, a lot of these have a, uh, uh, content from a story from the National Post that was written by Kelly Geraldine on uh, the 31st of March called Nunavut Celebrates 25th Anniversary with Optimism but Also Housing Concerns. So um, two very big developments. Uh, did get to mention them on the actual day but did want to make sure that I get got them into the Friday show because uh, we love it when we have an opportunity on the show to speak about the North because we don't do it enough in this country. And, you know, the North is a, a huge part of the Canadian identity. So it's uh, good to know what's going on over there. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, uh, you were mentioning the, the foreign uh, interference inquiry. Yes. 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 Yeah. <sighs> yes. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to pull the story back up here. So, yes, yeah, yeah, spy agency it. documents from, uh, I, I did put the link to it in the chat. It's from the CBC. It's uh, kind of wild. Uh, and, and if memory serves, when the conservatives said they wanted to look into China interference, or Beijing, Beijing interference, they yes. never say China. No. They wanted to look into the interference from Beijing and nowhere else. I wonder why that was. Mm. It seems to be coming out in the wash as time goes on, as they discovered that India supported pro-Indian candidates. Conservatives. Conservatives. Mm -hmm. How was it that the uh, uh, membership of the Conservative Party sold more memberships than any other party in history? See, because to sit, buy a membership, you don't even have to be a citizen. Anybody can yeah. buy a membership. Yep. Which is kind of bizarre when you think about it, right? Mm -hmm. And in nominations writings, you don't necessarily even have to be 18. Yeah. <laughs> I found that out last this last week uh, through this inquiry. Inquiry actually, um, Han Dong, who you mm -hmm. remember, was the liberal MP who has a left caucus who had been accused of uh, various things. They destroyed uh, his life. Destroyed his life. He testified at the public inquiry into election interference. He had stepped down as a member of the Liberal Caucus following accusations in the press that he had connections to Beijing and that he tried to convince Beijing not to free detainees Michael Spaver and Michael Koverig. Dong has denied these allegations and has taken legal action against the original source of the story, which was Global News. Uh, but he testified at the committee that in 2019, when he was fighting for the liberal nomination in Don Valley North, that Chinese students from a private high school came to cast ballots. And these are students that he had solicited. Unlike general elections, rules for who can vote and in party nominations are different. The liberals allow both minors and foreign nationals to vote in party nominations so long as they reside in the writing in question. Hmm. That's a little interesting. Campaign directors for the for the three major political parties all testified that the threat detection and warning mechanisms set up by Canada's spy agency and the federal government were inadequate and frustrating. The information received was neither useful nor actionable. That's something that we've heard many times before. 
um, former Conservative Party of Canada leader Aaron O'Toole then testified before the committee, and he testified that he was aware of attempts of foreign interference by China, and it claimed, he claims it cost the party six to nine seats, which would not have been enough to change the overall result of the election, but O'Toole suggested it might have been enough for him to have kept his job. Mm-hmm. No. Interesting. No, Aaron. No. You lost your job because you flip-flopped back and forth like a trout in a canoe. And your own party took you out. Yeah. Uh, six to nine more seats in the election would not have no. helped you, my, my friend. But but nice try. Um, O'Toole, um, he says he regrets not having mentioned it at the time, but he was attempting to avoid any suggestion that he was echoing voices in the U.S. arguing that Canada's election had somehow been stolen or rigged. I can see that. I don't know if that's an after-the-fact dis- uh, justification, but I-, I will be generous and give benefit of the doubt and assume that that, le- that could be a legitimate uh, situation at the time. I can understand where someone who has lost an election is trying to look for the reasons other than themselves for why they may have lost an election, said Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Ooh, the shade. (laughs) This, I'm surprised he didn't have a nail file while he was saying that. I can understand where someone who lost an election is trying to look for reasons other than themselves for which they might have lost the election. Just saying. (laughs) security officials and independent public servants have already confirmed that attempted foreign interference did not change the outcome in any single electoral district in the 2019 or 2021 elections but that did not stop Aaron O'Toole from taking the stand and saying that in 69 writings he believes that was indeed the case Handog testified uh, sorry Uh, so yeah uh, and then I believe uh, there were there was more testimony. Well, it, he says, <clears throat> whenever I talk about the two Michaels, I try to show that early release of the two Michaels is good for the relationship between the two countries. Therefore, it's something that the Chinese-Canadian community would like to see, he told the commission. And uh, former Special Rapporteur and Foreign Interference David Johnson investigated the claim that Dong meddled in efforts to free the two men and concluded in report released in May that that allegation was false. Dong filed a $15 million defamation lawsuit in April 2023 against Global News and its parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dong said Tuesday that the lawsuit is in the discovery stage. He also said he has no news about his chances of returning to the liberal fold. Johnston did conclude that there were irregularities observed with Dong's nomination for the federal liberals in 2019 and cited what he called a well-grounded suspicion that the irregularities were tied to the People's Republic of China, or PRC, consulate in Toronto, with whom Mr. Dong maintains relationships. In reviewing the intel, I did not find evidence that Mr. Dong was aware of the irregularities or the PRC consulate's potential involvement in his nomination, the report said. Dong told the commission Tuesday that meeting with diplomats is part of his job as an MP with a large Chinese diaspora. He said he also meets regularly with diplomats from Ukraine, Armenia, and Sri Lanka. As Dong testified on Tuesday, a document summarizing intelligence from CSIS and other security agencies related to his call with PRC officials regarding Kovrig and Spaver was made public at the inquiry. The unclassified summary says Dong expressed the view that even if the PRC released the two Michaels at that moment, opposition parties would view the PRC's action as an affirmation of the effectiveness of a hardline Canadian approach to the People's Republic of China. Right. Basically, kicking ass and taking names. Yep, as we mentioned, the Prime Minister stood up. Yep. That's why they waited until the U.S. election Mm -hmm. put Joe Biden in place to change their minds. Mm -hmm. Look, we realize that if we have to go into a a protracted battle with China, it doesn't matter how good we are and how well-trained we are. They just have the sheer numbers. They have the numbers. We're we're 41 million. They're 1.2 billion. Do the math, right? But taking a hard line and not backing down against a dictator, because I know even though it's supposed to be a communist country, it really isn't. 
because if you go to China, you'll see that all of the spoils of the West are available to purchase. And they're not at rock bottom prices, by the way. <laughs> what was it somebody described modern China? It was, and it was a Chinese man who described it. He says, modern China is um, on the surface a communist country. But if you scratch a little bit below, you'll see that it's not at all. It's more capitalist than anything else. And he says, here's how it is. You're following a car down the highway. It signals left, but turns right. That's China today. And I went, yeah, that, that seems to make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you have a, a dictatorial controlling government who oversees everything. So much so that Shenzhen, one of the most technologically advanced cities on earth, uh, an American fellow there working for Skull Candy, developing some product, was walking across the street and he was jaywalking because there was no traffic coming. Well, he got a notification halfway across the street on his phone that he'd just jaywalked. Then he got a notification when he got across the street that he'd been fined and the fine had been deducted from his bank account. <laughs> Before he got all the way across the street, he'd already been told, you're jaywalking, we have a photo of you. Here's the date, time, picture. They sent him the photo. Yeah, he's like, yeah, and I'm not even going to debate that. And then another notification, you're getting a fine. Then another notification, thank you for paying the fine. We, was, we withdrew the money from your account. This is how controlling the government is in China. Dang. Yeah. <clears throat> now, Shenzhen is, is somewhat different in, in, in the manner that it's much like Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong is the SAR special administrative region. Uh, and has been since 1997 when it was handed back from the UK. But Hong Kong operates differently and Shenzhen also operates differently. Shenzhen is, uh, Shenzhen is how it's pronounced. Shenzhen is how it's spelled. Shenzhen is very much uh, modern, Western, and open, liberal-minded city of 19 million. <laughs> 44 years ago, there was, I think, 10,000 people that lived there. Yeah, the infrastructure is new. Uh, most of the buildings are quite new. The oldest building in Shenzhen, I think, is about 50 years old. Mm. It was a small fishing village, and now it is uh, one of the world's leading technological hubs. It's where everything is built. Damn near everything is built in Shenzhen. And again, like I said, it's a very open, liberal-minded city, unlike many other places in China. Chongqing mm. is also similar to that. And Chongqing, I think, is a city of 30 million people. Hmm. big damn city but yeah Shenzhen is a city I'd like to visit someday and there's uh, I've met some people who've been and said it's wild man you gotta see it oh and you don't use money or cash for anything there the cash mm -hmm. does not get exchanged it's it's all tap your card it's yeah. kind of wild yeah um, now at the foreign uh, interference inquiry um, yesterday I think it was yesterday um, but Communications Security Establishment Deputy Head Dan Rogers, Canadian Security Intelligence Services Director David Vigneault, and Royal Canadian Mounted Police Commissioner Michel Duhem were, and current Foreign Affairs Deputy Minister David Morrison were all slated to testify before the commission. Um, and that's where some of this information that you mentioned about uh, India and Pakistan came up, according to the CBC here. Um, the government of India had quote, intent to interfere and likely conducted clandestine activities, including using an Indian government proxy agent in Canada, according to an unclassified summary written by the Canadian Cir Security Intelligence Services. Two years later, earlier in 2019, government of Pakistan officials in Canada attempted to clandestinely influence Canadian federal politics with the aim of furthering the government of Pakistan's interest in Canada. Uh, these stock assessments were contained in documents that were tabled as part of the Federal Commission into Inquiry into Foreign Interference. And um, they're looking at, uh, as we mentioned, possible meddling by China, India, and Russia, and others in the 2019 and 2021 federal elections. The reports all bear notes of caution about the summaries being possibly uncorroborated, single-sourced, or incomplete. CSIS Director David Vigneault told the public inquiry that intelligence is not necessarily fact, something that we've mentioned on the show many times, and uh, it uh, may require further investigation. Uh, the government of Pakistan's foreign interference against Canada was primarily to promote political security and economic stability in Pakistan and to counter India's glo growing global influence, read one CSIS assessment, noting that Pakistan was a limited foreign interference actor. 
In the case of the 2019 election, CSIS said the Canadian government conducted what it called a threat reduction measure ahead of the vote meant to reduce the foreign interference threat posed by the government of Pakistan. The situation was monitored and assessed to have effectively reduced the threat of interference, CSIS wrote. CSIS said its intelligence shows India's government also meddled in the 2019 and 2021 federal elections. As you mentioned, India supported pro-Indian candidates. Uh, There were activities centered on a small number of electoral districts. CSIS uh, wrote that the government of India targeted those writings because there was a perception that, quote, a portion of Indo-Canadian voters were sympathetic to the Khalistani movement or pro-Pakistan political stances. Um, and as we mentioned, the Khalistani movement is the movement to create an independent state of Khalistan in India where uh, the Sikhs uh, could uh, be masters of their own domain, uh, which has played a key role in the assassination of uh, Hardeep Singh Nijar in mm-hmm. Surrey, as well as uh, the foiled assassination attempt in the United States, uh, also uh, alleged to be from the Indian government, uh, as alleged by the government of the United States in the court documents there. Uh, and uh, as we mentioned, because uh, I did watch the Fifth Estate episode, mm-hmm. um, and uh, actually, um, it didn't have much more information than we had already reported here yeah, on the show uh, when the, the news of uh, the, the court case in the United States came out because we did report it, I think, that day or the day of. Yes. Uh, so it was basically that put into a 45-minute form. Uh, a couple of additional details, however. Uh, but yes, it was uh, that uh, what was going on in the United States that led to the fact that there was something in Canada because their contact person had uh, let their informant know that uh, there was were some high value targets in Canada that they would need a team there as well. So both uh, the incidents that are going on in the United States and in Canada uh, are indeed related, uh, if not directly, then tangentially, for sure. Um, CSIS uh, summary goes on to say that it has amassed a body of intelligence that indicates the government of India proxy agent may have attempted to interfere in democratic processes by providing illegal financial support to pro-Indian candidates. Any such financial contribution could have been remained unknown to the candidate, CSIS said. It does not identify the specific writings in the report that may have been subject to India's meddling. Uh, CSIS describes the proxy agent as, quote, a specific individual who takes explicit and or implicit direction from a foreign state while obfuscating the link between influence activities and a foreign state. Um, proxy, uh, proxy agents are based in Canada and don't necessarily have to belong to a specific diaspora community, CSIS explains, and, quote, are witting participants in furthering the objective of the foreign state in specific circumstances. The documents are a series of unclassified summaries of intelligence primarily authored by CSIS with, quote, input and agreement from the Communication Security Establishment, Canada's other spy agency which focuses on electronic surveillance, Global Affairs Canada, the Privy Council Office, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and Public Safety Canada. Pakistan and India have not been the focus of testimony during this phase of the inquiry. Uh, The proceedings have largely been geared towards alleged foreign interference by China, but two South Asian countries have come up in other documents tabled at the inquiry. A public summary of a classified CSIS briefing provided to political parties dated June 2019 lists India and Pakistan, among other state actors, that could engage in meddling with Canada. Uh, Redacting a word that appears right before the word Pakistani in a sentence, the briefing goes on to say, quote, Pakistani officials in Canada have likely tried to clandestinely influence and support Canadian politicians of Pakistani descent with the aim of furthering Pakistani interests in Canada. Three of the five paragraphs about India in that briefing note are largely redacted, but it notes, quote, Indian officials have utilized a network of contacts which includes politicians, academics, business persons, media personalities, and community leaders to monitor Canada-based individuals that are of interest to the government of India. CSIS also wrote that it's observed that there have been Indian interference activities targeted at Canadian members of parliament, provincial legislative members, outside the scope of regular diplomatic norms. In July 2021, Security Intelligence Threats Elections to Elections, SITE, Task Force, a Canadian government body consisting of senior civil servants from the RCMP, CSIS Global Affairs, and the CSE, held a briefing to political parties about lessons learned from the 2019 election. A lot of uh, MPs that got that briefing said it was basically useless and had no actionable information for them. It was uh, just so high level that they couldn't really do anything with it. 
um, the document had a section about Pakistan which was completely redacted, so not much helpful there. On India, uh, SITE said that the briefing the country is at, said in that briefing that the country is, quote, actively conducting foreign interference and targets Canadian political figures. Working through Indian officials in Canada, India engages in a range of activities that seek to influence Canadian communities and politicians in order to advance its political interests. India is interested in engaging its diaspora in Canada to shape political outcomes in its favor. Um, so, you know, hardly an earth-shattering relation here, but that's why they're saying that the, the action is, uh, that the information is rather unactionable because they're not exactly saying how, who, when, why, mm -hmm. just that they want to and they have an interest and they think it would be in their interest to do so, which is, you know, I mean, everybody else could kind of figure that out sitting at home. Um, so yes, unless there's more detailed information or specific information about plots or initiatives, there's not much uh, politicians can do with that type of warning. No. But it's interesting to see uh, uh, this testimony uh, come out and that we're hearing about it. And uh, it's also nice to see that uh, um, that this inquiry's mandate has uh, gone uh, beyond just China yes. and just two elections. Well, as it should be, because let's face it. Um... Well, you either care about the issue about intellectual interference, foreign interference in a political system or not. It's one or the other. Right. So if you only care about it well, only in China and you only care about it in those two election cycles and not any others, then you don't really care about the issue. You care about specifically China for some other issue that you're trying to get to. There's a little bit of rage farming to, to try and make your side look better. And that's really all it is because they absolutely didn't want to go back more than eight years. They absolutely didn't want to investigate Russia or India or Pakistan or anything other than Beijing. Remember, they never say China. The conservatives never say China. They say Beijing. Because if they say China, then, then that's going to enrage the nation, number one. And number two, they signed the FIPA agreement in secret, which ties us to China for, what, 30 more years or 20 more years or whatever the hell it is? It was 31 in total when it started. And when was that? 2014 that it started? 2014 uh, or 2015? So there's about 20 years left, yeah. approximately. 20 or 21 years left. I'm not even sure. It might be 20 years came into force in 2014 so it's been 10 years already so 21 years left they, we can get out of it a little, couple of years early i think there's a provision for that but like after 27 or something mm. this is the the same party that sold off air canada that's well actually that's technically a different party but sold off air canada that was mulrooney's uh, progressive conservatives uh, it's, this is the party that sold the wheat board to the saudis that sold uh, the intellectual property of nortel to Sweden, I think. Yeah, sold Dexon to China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All they want to do is make a quick buck. They sold. Uh, well, Petro Canada is no longer a Crown Corp. Yeah, that's been that's been a while now. Yeah, it's been quite a while now that you yeah. say that. Yeah. I think that was under Mulroney, maybe. Uh, no, no, no. Or Crete. Uh, no, it's I think been a while since it's been divested. I think it was Harper. And then let's not forget that they sold uh, shares in General Motors for a loss. It's just, you know, if it's not one thing, it's another. Selling us off bit by bit, piece by piece, the things that we built as a nation in many cases with our collective tax dollars, and they just want to sell it for a quick buck because, you know, let's not care about tomorrow when all we have to worry about is today. And I get it. Look, I have to live for today, but our government is supposed to look out for us for tomorrow because they have the necessary funding to do that. Many of us don't, but our government does. They have, we're, we've got a AAA credit rating. We're still the number one country in the world to invest in, to live in. We have the lowest unemployment in history. Mm -hmm. After eight years of Justin Trudeau. <laughs> yeah. Well, with regard to Petro Canada, yeah. In 1990, the Mulroney government announced its intention to privatize Petro-Canada, and the first shares were sold on the open market in July 1991. Mm -hmm. Then Petro-Canada was bought by Suncor. Right, okay. Or merged with Suncor later on. But yeah, it, it was a while ago, because I remember that. Uh, the only reason I remember that is because when the, remember when the, the Calgary had the Olympics? In 88. Uh, yes, Petro-Canada had this thing that they were selling like pins. Mm-hmm. 
for one one of the, each of the ten sports. I actually had them and collected them, and it was in the Petro Canada. Glasses. I used to have the glasses as well. Yeah. It was a couple of years after that that it was private. That was private. I remember like it like really stuck in my mind because mm -hmm. I you know Petro Canada and Olympics were associated in my in my mind, and I was an Olympic nut. I still am. But as a kid, I was definitely an Olympic nut. So I, I yeah, when Petro Canada was sold, I was like, oh, really? <laughs> For some reason, that just got, I, I, as I mentioned, kids and cubs. I was a very, very weird child. I retained really weird information. <laughs> We're all weird in our own little way, trust me. <laughs> indeed, indeed we are. Um, all right. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> I have a little something stuck in my throat here. Um, if you are in Alberta, uh, the first NDP Alberta leadership debate will take place in Lethbridge on April 25th of the month. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got. You're gonna live there. You need. To, you need. To, you need a moment. You gotta. You want to take a beat. You want to take a nap. Maybe lie down for a few minutes. Have a cup of coffee and maybe. A, oh. A cigarette? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just love to lie down for a couple of minutes. Uh, sorry about that, kiss and cups. So the the first debate of the Alberta NDP leadership race will take place in Lethbridge on April 25th. April 22nd is the last day to buy your memberships. Um, some things that may have happened or influenced some of the decisions. It would appear that uh, word got out that uh, Nahed Nenshi had doubled the party's membership in just a few days after announcing his run, which may have been one of the things that convinced uh, uh, Raki Pancholi to suspend her own campaign and uh, instead work for his. Um, there was some speculation at the time that if Pancholi would have joined anyone, it might have been a Kathleen Ganley who had uh, registered uh, to run as well. Um, but uh, yeah. That's uh, what happens. So we'll get ready for debate, see what happens there. But it seems that it's uh, membership sales uh, that people have been openly uh, bragging about. And it's similar to what Pierre Polyev did in the, the federal leadership when he was bragging about his membership sales really early to try to paint himself as inevitable and get uh, the other uh, candidates to possibly drop out of the race. Um, no, I'm not saying that Nancy did that with, that with that intent, but you know, when you... When you double the size of your party's membership in a few days after you announce that you're running, it's typically it's pretty much over. <laughs> if that is indeed true. Here's so a, uh, just I just saw something here from uh, this just released. Uh, employment uh, labor force survey March twenty twenty four. Unemployment is at six point one percent. It went up. Yes. Just yep, came across five point eight, I believe. Yeah, this is from StatsCan. I'll put it in the, the link in the chat if anybody wants to have a look at it. It's it's pretty detailed, a lot of analysis, a lot of data there. If you want to read about it, it explains how it comes up with this. Unemployment rate rises to six point one percent. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's uh, a lot of uh, companies have been announcing layoffs and cuts yes. uh, lately. And uh, I believe the United States report was uh, scheduled to come in uh, as well. Uh, I believe that the United States was looking at uh, 200,000 um, jobs. At least that was uh, some... 303. The prediction. So they came in at 303? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm looking at it right here from Bloomberg. Wow. Uh, U.S. payrolls jumped 303,000. Unemployment rate drops. Labor participation rate rises more than expected. Strong reports suggest Fed can stay patient on inflation. Uh, Fed swaps shift full pricing of rate cut to September. Huh. And their unemployment rate dropped to 3.8 from 3.9. Wow. And the rate has now come in below 4% for 26 straight months, the longest such streak since the 1960s. Wow. Yeah. Well, usually that's good for us. When the economy does well in the United States, it usually does well for us too. So, um, yep. We have a, a little bit of a, I guess, a, a dip on ours. Well, Let's see what it says. Uh, year over year, the unemployment rate is up one percentage point uh, from last year. Uh, in March, employment declined among youth aged 15 to 24, while it rose 
Among core-aged men 25 to 54, employment was little changed among core-aged women as well as among women and men aged 55 and older. Fewer people employed in accommodation and food services, hotel, real and trade, retail and trade, professional scientific and technical services. Employment increased in healthcare and social assistance. Employment decreased in Quebec, Saskatchewan, Manitoba in March while it increased in Ontario. Total work hours, hours worked in March were virtually unchanged. Hourly wages among employees rose 5.1% on a year-on-year over-year basis in March, following growth of 5.0% in February. So uh, wage uh, wages are going up still higher than inflation and uh, at a rate slightly faster than the previous month. Um, this is the sixth consecutive month that the employment rate in Canada has fallen. Uh, the employment rate, the proportion of the population aged 15 and older who are employed, declined by 0.1 percentage points to 61.4% in March, the sixth consecutive monthly decrease. Um, and let's see, what else do we have here? I think those are the main uh, lines of, yep, there you go. Uh, yep, those are the main lines of the, the report over here. <coughs> So, uh, again, um, probably uh, you might hear some conservatives start making some hay about mm -hmm. uh, where are all the jobs going. Well, of course they'll do that. Yeah. Well, let's not forget the conservatives cannot win an election without Quebec, and they don't have Quebec. They don't. Uh, technically, they can. Yeah, well, I suppose. Harper won an election without Quebec. True, but it's not easy, and it's a yeah. slim. Yeah, but uh, all of Ontario has to flip in a good chunk of Atlantic Canada. Well, and, and you know, in, in Quebec, they have had carbon pricing since 2007. So his axe the tax slogan yeah. is completely the, meaningless there. Well, the, the, the axe the tax slogan in Quebec and in British Columbia is about as useful as uh, Mulcair's uh, promise in the previous campaign uh, to do something for child care as it applied to Quebec. Yeah. Right. There was nothing in that program. That program was going to help all the other provinces, but there was nothing in it that was going to benefit Quebec specifically. And if he was trying to keep Fortaleza Quebec in his hands, uh, that particular policy plank was going to do nothing to help that. So, yeah. You do what you can with what you got, I guess. Um, some good news. The We don't talk about this uh, a lot. The International Blind Ice Hockey Series blind ice hockey will start on April 12th in St. Louis. And uh, the reason this is particularly notable is uh, there's a young man named Dante Guillemaroli from Edmonton, who at the age of 15 is the youngest player ever named to the national blind hockey team. Mm. He has about 7% of his vision remaining as a result of a genetic condition. So uh, definitely wishing good luck to Team Canada over in St. Louis as they will be representing us over there. And as we mentioned yesterday, the uh, International Ice Hockey Federation's Women World Championship is uh, about to get underway. Canada had a warm-up game against Finland the other night. And uh, we, uh, we know that our Canadian women kick ass. So uh, let's hope that we will have uh, more world champions to talk about soon over there. Um, did you know that it's Rachel Holman's birthday today? I did not know it was Rachel Holman's birthday today. I'm 35 today. Well, there you go. Happy birthday, Rachel, and the well done. Well done, well and done. She was born on this day in 1989 in Ottawa. As a curler, she has won four Canadian national championships, two world championships, four Scotties, and appeared at two Olympics. So you're typical underachiever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of classic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I tell you. Um, trying to think, if uh, see if I've got any other stuff. Uh, oh, also, uh, if we're talking about that, uh, the NCAA, as we mentioned, uh, I think we're getting down to the final, final matches here. Weekend. Yeah, final yeah. fours this weekend. So There were uh, 43 Canadians in all playing in the men's and women's tournament. Um, uh, there's a young lady named Caitlin Clark who somewhere along the way, I don't think she's Canadian, but, uh, set the record for the most points scored men or women in NCAA uh, activity. Uh, and there's a Canadian named Leah Edwards who has been playing with one of the teams. Apparently she's been playing with a broken nose the entire time. 
And uh, of course, uh, on uh, the men's side, uh, all the buzz has been around uh, some guy who's uh, only seven foot four, named Zach Eady, also oh, Canadian. He's from Montreal, uh, isn't he? I think so. Yes, uh, who was a player of the year last year in the U.S. Uh, from Purdue. Uh, I don't know if uh, seven they, uh, foot four. <laughs> So he doesn't have to dunk. He just reaches up and drops the ball in. <laughs> Literally. Like, Literally. On. He can like, touch the rim standing. You know, I was thinking about this the other day, right? You know, when you when we're talking about wrestling and boxing, when we have weight classes. Mm-hmm. And then there are other sports where we don't have weight classes. Like, for example, rowing. Every freaking man in that boat is minimum six foot three. Wow. So if I wanted a career... As an Olympic rower, no matter how good a rower I would be, because I could never make an Olympic team because if I'm dealing with someone who's six foot three and has all that wig span and whatnot, of course they're going to row harder and faster than me. Like this. So why do they not have weight classes for rowing so short people can <laughs> row and get a good, <laughs> short tiny people can get a medal as well, right? So <laughs> you're thinking, or hockey, when everybody is like six foot three, six foot four, six foot, you know, basketball, seven foot four, it's like, Maybe we need a form of basketball where the nets rather than being 10 feet off the ground or 15 feet off the ground for the people that are seven foot tall and tall. <laughs> See if they can jump. Wow. So the former <laughs> tallest player in, in NBA history at 2.31 meters or seven foot seven. Yeah. Uh, uh, George Dimitru Muresen, known as the Giant, a Romanian former pro basketball player at seven foot seven, one of the two tallest players to have ever played in the NBA. Wow. Wow. Okay. Seven foot seven. So, yeah, Purdue uh, is still in it. Oh, are they? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Purdue is going to play North Carolina State uh, in one of the semifinals, and uh, UConn faces Alabama in the other one and uh for the women uh so uh, mr ed will definitely be uh, playing there uh for the women we have in our final four north carolina state versus south carolina in one matchup and yukon again so uh you can you connecticut uh their men and women's program both of them meet for final four against iowa uh i do not know if there are any uh Notable Canadians uh, playing on any of these four teams for the for the women, but uh, yeah, Canadians uh, earning some press there as well. Um, North Carolina State, in particular, uh, I don't remember if they were still in. If I mentioned, were, or were they in the bracket? Let me just check that again. Uh, yes, they are. They're facing Purdue, and uh, they are. Uh, the Cinderella story of the tournament, it would appear. So, um, and I had it right in front of me why it was that they were the, it, oh, there we go. Uh, they had to win five games in five days to get out of their conference to actually just make the tournament. And uh, they were far from the best ranked team, but uh, they brought that momentum into the tournament and now they have advanced to the final four. So there you go. According to Kit Jim, according to recent data, there are currently around 40 players in the NBA who are seven feet or taller. Yeah. There you go. All right. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, uh, do we have a show? We do indeed, sir. Do indeed. Let's All right, get some puppy up so we can uh, get, we can get, get we can get to the day. weekend. Yeah. We can start weekending. Yes. Kiss and Cubs, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember, sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps all about us. We really appreciate it when you do. If you would like to be sure that you do not miss an episode, you do not have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl. You can scan that QR code that's right under my chin, and that will bring you to our pod page. That's podpage.com slash the true North Eager Beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And uh, that way, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, we'll come directly to you. If you'd like to support us in other ways, the QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head right now will bring you to our coffee page. If you would like to make a donation to the Eager Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund, 
that's a little fund that we use to help pay for production costs and everything that we need to do the show that uh, you love. So if you would like to help us with that, uh, we would be very grateful. If you're listening, that's coffee, ko-fi.com slash eagerbeaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. All donations are appreciated. We thank you for your generosity. But of course, the gift of your attention is the one that is most precious to us. If you would like to help us in other ways, make like Kit Elaine and go to our True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page and click like, share, subscribe. Three buttons for you to have fun with there. We love it when you click us. Makes us very happy. So thank you for that very, 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 very much. Because democracy is something that you do. Do write those letters, please. Let people know how you feel. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom for us? Uh, you know, as we go into this weekend in uh, what currently is miserable weather in Canada's capital, there's uh, it's cold, wet, snowy, yucky, not pleasant. It is, keep in mind, over the next few days, spring will spring. It's going to be 14, 15, 16 over the next few days. So if you're if you're down and out and depressed right now about the weather in the city of Ottawa, just hold on for a little while. Just hold on for a couple more days. Spring will be here in due course. We'll be back to more normal temperatures. And we can get outside and do some of the things we like to do at this time of the year. But you know what? Here's the thing. This snow is actually good because... We haven't had a lot of precipitation this spring. And you know how they say April showers. Well, in this case, it was April snow. But there's enough wetness on the ground right now that the, it's going to be a little mucky and spongy and probably, ah, yes, that springtime smell of um, dog feces that people have failed to clean up. <laughs> we all know that smell all too well, right? Ah, Yes. You know, you, uh, uh, yes, Katavi G, you're right there with me. You're right there. You're reading my mind because uh, you were talking about, uh, you know, the rain and the sunshine like this. And you almost, you almost, almost, almost put out lyrics from Wilson, Wilson Phillips, Hold On. When you were yeah, I know. I know. I, got, got I was aware. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say you that. Can you hold on for one more day? <laughs> Things will go your way. <laughs> hold on for one more day. <laughs> That's the grizzly version because uh, I, uh, I, I I can occasionally hit a high note. Right now, this morning, I'm not going to be able to do it. But sometimes yeah. I can. I can. I, I'm I'm able to uh, channel my inner Mickey Mouse. Hey, Pluto! That's about as high as I can hit right now. Yep. On our on our show the other day, with there, uh, there's a, a moment where um, the bassist uh, plays the bass line. Mm. of any kind like this and it's a random one he's changing it every night and uh yeah started with the opening from crazy train oh yes, just yeah. like doo doo dun, dun, doo doo dun, dun, doo 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 and all of us on stage we went aye, aye, aye. <laughs> that wasn't part of the script but <laughs> we couldn't resist and then we heard the <laughs> that whatever instrument that makes that that, that sort of grating sound there that comes mm. after that. Uh, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, Kit Christian playing your bass right now. There you go. All right. Um, so. <laughs> Kid Cassie, I like the button in full view of my staff. Does that make me an exhibitionist? Yes. I guess. Yes, it does. <laughs> oh, Taffy, we're not going to do that. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. Pinch not for happening. Mademoiselle in just the right spot. We'll get you singing the high notes. And and, and before we go, uh, Mademoiselle, how was your debut? Yeah. I was asking how your debut was. I know. I just, I don't have headphones on right now. Um, it was so positive. It was so fun. Yay. And uh, we, we had some tech problems at the beginning, but uh, they'll be sorted out for next week. And... Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it, I mean this way. Uh oh, right. Nobody could see you. I don't want anyone to see my hair this morning. It looks lovely. Thank you. So, as does yours. Thank you. So, yeah, no, I just, uh, I am going to pinch him. It's not going to make me hit a high note. I, I can, I can't, I'm more of a mezzo singer. Is that the right term? Yep, mezzo soprano, yeah. I'm going off the rails on the crazy train. Uh, 
<laughs> I'm sorry, Douglas, I missed uh, a lot of the show because I slept in, which was lovely. But um, how was yeah. um, how was last night? Oh, wonderful. Good. Absolutely wonderful. Beautiful. We are spoiled. We are spoiled. Beautiful audiences, generous, laughing at the right spots, applauding at the base, the right spots. And they're all coming in. They're, they're all in the lobby before the show, just wanting to have a good time to start with, predisposed to having fun. Oh, that's you awesome. You can't ask for better. You just, you just can't ask for better. This is a gift. Oh, you're just, you're just giving me chills. It's like, a gift. Goosebumps, whatever they're called. <sighs> Like, so I'm so if, happy right now. <laughs> if, if you want, if anybody wants to check out the show, it's on my personal YouTube channel because we had. Uh, little did I know, uh, you can't go live right away. I had to put in a request to go live on Mademoiselle Fox's channel. So as a result, I had to uh, air it on my channel. It's there. I just put a link in, and uh, for some something went wrong. Try reloading the page. Yeah. I don't know. The chat's going a little bit haywire. It so. makes me feel better that someone who's a, a, a IT AV expert. Yet we couldn't get it happening. <laughs> yeah. Like you know, ultimately, who fucking cares? <laughs> like, no, I, I really appreciate that I could jump into Paul's channel. Um, and Douglas, I can't wait for you to come on. Ah, it's gonna be wonderful when we It'll do. It'll be fun. Oh, maybe yeah. next Thursday. And oh, Linda, possibly yes, because I'm not on stage. Oh, oh, that would be awesome. And uh, just Linda. You're famous, and my mother loves you. <laughs> cool. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so. Linda jumped in for a bit last night, oh. as did Alan. I was on for a little bit, um, but yeah, it was it was good. I thought you know, technical hiccups they happen, they happen. Oh, yeah. You know, we we mitigate them the best we can. First world problems, right? Yeah, like, exactly. Anyway, well, I'm I'm gonna go make some more soup because Paul is insisting. No, that he's I, not. That I use the slow cooker more. No, he okay. is not. <laughs> I, Douglas, I snuck a slow cooker into his house and I promised, I lied. I said I would take it back to my place. No. I'm not doing that. It's she, staying here. So I'm like, okay. where's my George Foreman grill? She's like, I put it away somewhere. <laughs> where? Where? Somewhere. It's stuffed be, It's stuffed in a in a slot where pans are supposed to go. Somewhere under oh, the God. counter. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he hasn't in the whole year, almost a year. It's almost our anniversary uh, that I've known him. He's never used the friggin' thing. I use it all the time. You're just not here. Okay. <laughs> you're well, not here when I'm cooking burgers, because when you're here, you won't let me cook anything in my own kitchen. So, kids, how about them Jays? Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll argue off camera later. Douglas, love you. Love you all. Have okay. a great Friday. Have a great weekend. And your, your nails look Almost as good as mine. No, they look oh, awesome. They look great. You. Okay, ciao. I'm okay. at the point now where the, the, the things are starting to chip and there's only like three shows left, so I don't want to reapply because I don't mm. want to. Yeah, you want it gone. Yeah. 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 I want it gone. Yeah, mine it's are, really, it's really weird. I actually feel it. Really? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's like there's like extra weight on my fingers a little bit or something really? like that. Like, I, yeah, yeah, I could feel, I, I, I could feel like the extra thickness and it's like, it's, Every now and then, it's a bit of a weird feeling, I have to say. It's a, <laughs> some people hate having their nails painted, like they don't like the feeling of it. I love it. Mine look like caca right now. And uh, Jim, I know we don't like it when mommy and daddy fight. Yes. And Jay, cracking the whip. Oh, you haven't even seen that yet. <laughs> John, this we could talk about whips another time. You could talk about that on your show. Excite me. Na, 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 we're, we're not, we're not, we're not come doing on, that. Come on, I like it, like it. Come you on. guys can talk about that. On your <laughs> show. You can cut my mic uh, soon. I just feel it coming. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I am. Love you, Dan. Yeah, Dan goes. So I know a fox, a bear, and a beaver. That we sound like a joke. <laughs> so a, fox, a bear, a beaver, and a, beaver and a fox walk, walk into a bar. A bar. Yeah. Oh, so an Irishman walked out of a bar. It could happen. It could happen. <laughs> Walked out of a bar. A bear, a fox, and a beaver start a podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and a, a big All right. dog. Yeah. A big dog. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Mr. Grizzly, please cue that cock. Let me just uh, find out where I put it here. I, I hid it away somewhere. Oh, here we are. You are listening to 
a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. <laughs> oh yeah i'm getting some I'm kids getting being roasted. cheeky I'm getting <laughs> roasted, I yeah cheeky kids. i walked right into it no yes no, you did no, no, i was no. going to say something myself but i i, I exercised restraint because mm. <laughs> seriously how could you lose that damn thing <laughs> oh sorry 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 <laughs> that just <laughs> did that just slip out oh sorry oh oh sorry oh, <laughs> I've got one little Easter egg for you here. Um, I'll, I'll put it on the screen and I'll read it. This is the hypocrisy. Whoops. The hypocrisy of conservatives. Doug Ford is blaming Prime Minister Trudeau for increased rents, but he, Doug Ford, canceled rent control in Ontario. And he's blaming mm-hmm. Prime Minister Trudeau for carbon pricing, but he, Doug Ford, canceled the cap and trade program Ontario had and switched to the carbon tax. Are people really this gullible? Doug Ford is a liar. Some people are. Yeah. It takes all kinds to make a world, and some people are. Ooh. Yeah. You can that, see yeah, not, you guys definitely got more than we did. Yeah, it's not pleasant out there. It's been snowing on and off since yeah. last night and early into this morning. It's just, it's not, it's not good. It's, you know, but like I said, don't let it bring you down too much. It's going to be a pleasant weekend, and as time goes on, it will get better. It will. It will. It's springtime. We promise. It's springtime. Right. Well, I got to go. I've got to go. Springtime for beaver and grizzly. <laughs> See you. <guys. laughs> See you guys.